thank you for your kind invitation. I'm, 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 I'm very impressed with the, uh, with the setup here and, and uh, well done, Ray, for organizing what seems to be a very good, a very good day. Um, just to, 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 to get you in the, in the frame of where we're coming from now, this is Mullingar. And this is the view from David Mortel's house where he looks out on the little uh, church island. And um, I'm talking on outpatient operative hysteroscopy. So I suppose we've had, I mean, the danger on a day like this is there's going to be a lot of repetition of different bits. So I've tried to, to focus on my brief really here, which is to, to bring us along from the... the uh, diagnostic setup and to see where we should be going with uh, uh, with procedures. And I want as well just to go through uh, uh, the indications. Isn't that what you asked me, Ray? The different indications that we would have for uh, for hysteroscopy. Now, the traditional, the background here is, is 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 I suppose from the days when this was set up 20 years ago or whatever was the the uh, five millimeter sheet with carbon dioxide and. Uh, maybe a flexible, I suppose, at the beginning with a lot of flexible work and uh, using power cervical block and, 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 and local anesthesia with the speculum. This was the original uh, setup, which, which um, I suppose, when you look at the equipment and the equipment that's developed over the last 20 years has allowed us to progress and has allowed us to, to, to move into what we were talking about earlier on with the... the um, uh, with the vaginoscopic and with the easier approach and, and, and a better view. And the, I suppose the telescope itself is crucial and the, the, the rod lens versus fiber optic systems, again, I like to have uh, a good view. I like to have a very good view. And that's one of the main reasons I don't like the, the, the fiber optic thingy. I like to have a very clear view that you get from the rod lens. And the fiber optic will give you the smaller diameter, but there's the, you're, you're, you're paying for it with the, uh, with the view and with the image size. And, and I know, Mark, you've got a, you, you used to be always fiber optic flexible, and now you've moved over, haven't you? So I think... Hmm? No more fiber optics. Okay, so that's that sorted. Okay, so they were, they were, <laughs> on the, 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 the image, again, is much better with the, 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 I suppose, as you get slightly bigger. And again... The, the, the handling, you have to be aware, if you've got six or eight or ten hysteroscopes uh, in the theatre, you don't want three or four of them broken every week, so that you have to be careful about what you're actually using. Um, now, from the patient's point of view, the crucial bit is the outer diameter, and if you can get a scope that's less than four millimetres or whatever, you have a much better chance in the menopausal woman or whatever, or the nulliparous woman, in getting that thing in without her feeling an awful lot. If you've got a regular um, patient complaining of bleeding problems, etc., etc., there's no problem with a five millimeter scope or more. So, I personally have been inclined to go with the five millimeter scope, which is 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 it doesn't require uh, dilation and it doesn't require anesthesia. And I suppose in some ways, if you're getting to the greater than five, where we're getting now with the uh, with the morselator equipment and where you're adding on different bits and pieces onto it. So the scopes are beginning to creep up again to about six and a bit or whatever. So you're pushing the boundaries and what the woman can tolerate. And um, I'd be interested to, 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 to hear from our later speakers about how they're going to address that and get the scopes maybe back to where we want them, back to the five millimeter. Um, this now, uh, Bitachi is not coming to this meeting, Walter, is he? No. Um, well, he sent a little picture then, anyway, for, for, for you, <laughs> just to say hello. So he, he's, I suppose, the vaginoscopy guy. He's the guy that kind of really put it on the map, and he said, oh, I do, and he, he works in Bali, and, and uh, he wears a white suit, and he said, I just go in, like John luc he just walks in on his own and does the little examination, and everything is, nobody feels anything, and it's, it's, uh, but it's been good. It's been very good, and I think it's been good for the specialty, really, that... That's what I came with me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we're still using this scope here. The scope on the top is the scope that was designed by Vitachi with Storz, and, and uh, this is, is it's a five millimeter scope, and it carries a channel that take a five French instrument in it. So I think that that the five French really is the minimum of what you're going to need to put down any sort of a useful instrument. Now he has also brought a smaller scope that you see on the bottom. Now this one has got a smaller telescope but it still has the five French channel. So the, 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 I'm working with these scopes. So I've got about 
uh, six or eight of the big ones and, and, and a couple of the small ones that I would keep in reserve if, if we're not able to get in with the bigger one. But this is the standard working model is this five millimeter uh, scope. It's got, obviously it's got the, the continuous flow and it's got the access. So that if I need to do something, I don't need to take out the telescope and get a different one or whatever. So once we're using this telescope, you can pretty much do what you're going to do uh, there again without changing anything. Now the, the original sea and treat here as described by, by Vitachi and, and, and many others and since then is using continuous flow saline and um, using a suction irrigation or whatever and high range <coughs> instruments. Now the, the saline versus gas thing I think as well has probably moved on to saline and, and the, the, the gas as water makes it, it's probably the gas going through. But the main problem with the gas really is that it pushes in and it creates a big pressure inside in the cavity so that you can't really get a clear view. With the saline, you can let down the pressure and you're looking more like a natural view of, of, of the endometrium. Plus, you'll wash out any blood or bits or whatever, whatever out of it. So, you know, all in all, I think nearly everybody has gone over to saline. Um, now, Vitachi then described a 30 degree lens so that you can see then the, the corner, you can see the side and he said you're looking then I suppose if you're looking with a 30 degree lens you're looking a little bit off center to what your, your, your scope is doing when your scope is introduced um, so he says rotate the scope because his scope is it's oval uh, so he says rotate it a little bit as you're going through so if you're going through a multi uh, cervical loss it's, it's, it's oval shaped so that he says put it in sideways or whatever if there's a little bit of, of give it's, it's probably better to do it like that now audit, audit, audit we did an audit about 10 years ago whatever it was I haven't done one since in here but there was about 300 women in it over, over two years and this is the setup so again it's quite a simple setup that we have in 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 in, in, uh, in our hysteroscopy set. We just use a plain uh, giving set and a bag of fluid, whatever it is, saline or glycine or whatever. Is, is, it's, I mean, it, just, it doesn't matter what it is, really, but this, the glycine is good if you're using uh, uh, diathermy. But, I mean, for, 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 for most of these, we're not using diathermy. Now, I will always use uh, a little outflow. You can see there the little um, the outflow tube, and we just put it. That's, that's part of the little gear there for the... the, the the SEO where you can just get in the, the open thing. But anyway, it's simple. It's an inflow, outflow, and a light lead, and, and uh, that's about that's about all you need. Um, uh, so patient informed and relaxed, no speculum, no prep, visually or digitally. And I think Walter is saying that maybe there are two techniques. I think maybe it's probably easier to look on them as one technique where where um, you would introduce the hysteroscope uh, through the vagina without anything. And if you see the cervix, in you go, good and well. If you don't, and in some places, and people are different, the anatomy is different, sometimes you won't. So in those cases, um, I would often uh, put in a finger at that stage to see where the cervix is and, and, and get it through. But it's not necessary in, 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 in every case. And another, I would use a 12 degree lens that I think it's, it's, it, I think it's more useful and it's easier to, to, to get in. And using the 12 degree, it's easier in the cervical canal where you're not so off center with the, the, the 30. I think it's for going in a straight direction, the 30 carries a lot of, of offset. So that I think that the 12 is, is, is much easier for, uh, it's much easier for working with, with, uh, with the instruments or whatever. So anyway, getting around to my talk, I think number one and number two indications are heavy menstrual bleeding and, and, and postmenopausal bleeding, obviously. And the recommend it uh, by NICE and all our good friends and the rest is that we would do an ultrasound scan as a screener for people presenting with, with abnormal uterine bleeding, which is, which is fair enough. And particularly, if I've got somebody in clinic who is, uh, who is young, nulliparous, a nervous patient, you ask a patient or whatever, and they say, oh, I don't want to scope, whatever, whatever. And the, the, the nervous patient, fine, do a scan, see what's what. You know, and, and um, so you have Again, depending on your setup in your particular hospital, or, or, or uh, you might have easy access to scan, or you might have easy access to, to hysteroscopy. And I know now in the in the Dutch setup, you'll probably have much easier access to hysteroscopy, and, and so people will end up 
I know when you guys started off, and everybody ended up having hysteroscopies, and then you kind of come back again a little bit and say, well, maybe we probably should do some more scans or whatever. So it, it's uh, you got to fit it in with what's available. And, 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 and use them accordingly. I think for a woman where you know you're going to need to do a biopsy with heavy postmenopausal, maybe just bring her in a hysteroscope and see once what. Or for somebody who needs a marina or whatever, you know, it's 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 so it's going to be it's going to be slightly uh, slightly different depending on on, on, on your patient. Um, now there's me and Walter in theatre. I thought I'd show this little video, Walter, for you. Let's go back a bit. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> but it's just this is just really to show you the the. Uh, the scope and the digital, as, as, as Walter says, to check the, 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 the cervix. And then there's, there's an inflow and an outflow and the camera on the end. I've got a, a nice old camera there that, that's self-writing. Self they don't make that anymore, but you can see there now where it's going in there on the side. So that's going in laterally and just to, to, to um, uh, yeah, so that one is. Now let's move on to another patient here for uh, 47-year-old. Uh, lady with with heavy menstrual bleeding. Now, so again, so this now is the the the, the endocervix, and and as we see that there's no pressure on the endocervix, so there's no there's no bleeding or trauma uh, with the scope. So we'll bring the scope through here, and you can see from the the flicker on the edge there that it's about uh, it's looking sideways. Now. There's a little bit of old blood there. You see there, there's some adhesions there just coming into the uterus. And this little bit is the little bit that the patient will feel. Just that last little bit at the end of the, the uh, cervix on the internal loss. So just that little push is needed. But I think it's better just to do it and do the little push and just have the patient aware. So if you do it smoothly and quickly, then there's no problem with the patient. And once you get the, the scope into the uterine cavity, then it's much easier. And you've got over. So the only difficult bit really is that last little bit. And... It, it, the patients are different. Some patients you can just put it in and they don't even know you've done it. And, and some patients will need a little push for that last little bit. But if you tell her there's going to be a little push and just do it quickly, then uh, life is much easier for the patient. So the findings in our audit here were, were, were similar, really. You're going to get similar findings wherever you look. Um, premenopausal, postmenopausal. So the postman, premenopausal, 90% normal. I mean, this is, this is the... the uh, the old DUB, isn't it, and the heavy menstrual bleeding or whatever. So a smaller proportion of polyps, and a bigger proportion then of polyps and fibroids in the, the postmenopausal. Um, now for, I suppose, those 90% those of women, uh, a lot of them are presenting to you with heavy menstrual bleeding and you're assessing them then for, uh, A, you're doing examination and then normal bang. Then you move on to, to uh, what are you going to do for them? And um, dermatologist, I don't know why I got that up, yeah. I think it's it's uh, it's probably still it's probably still um, it's probably still being used here. Um, well, I put it up because it's very popular in Ireland. Yeah, that's and uh, the, the, the the balloon. If you look at, at uh, endometrial ablation uh, under local anaesthesia, so this now has been uh, has been put about by nice guideline for heavy menstrual bleeding. Ablative technique should be undertaken under local anaesthetic where appropriate. So I suppose we're we're. We're certainly a long way off from that. I don't know, in the UK, are, are there many that have been done under Logan? Not that many, really. Yeah, in some senses, a lot. But overall, it's probably a very small yeah. proportion. And, and this is still, they still managed to get into the NICE guideline as, 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 as being the way to do it. You know, so, I don't know. I mean, if, if um, for a local anesthesia and visualization, it has to be fairly painless. You need a, a small uh, probe diameter, and it needs to be quick. It needs to, and I think that with the um, uh, certainly with the with the thermal choice, it's not quick. So you're looking there at about eight millimeters of thing, eight minutes. I mean, I could not sit there for eight minutes talking to a patient about what she's feeling and not feeling. I mean, you know, I've never done it. With her. I never will. <laughs> but I think that the the the, the thermal blade is is, is 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 the newer one, and and it's got to be bent. It's quicker. Yeah, you know, it's got to be. You've got to be two minutes or less, I think, really, to 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 uh, uh, to do it. So they're getting there. They're getting there. They're <laughs> and the the HTA, the still the odds. I mean, I don't. I mean, realistically, at the moment, is the thermal blade and the Novasure, and the Novasure has in the UK has, has, has more or less taken the market because uh, it's quick and and uh, it's efficient. But it's still, it's got a wide diameter, you know. And and and, and the trouble is, if you're looking at a uh, 7.2 millimeter diameter. It's not easy to get a 7.2 uh, 
uh, you've got to dilate the cervix. There's not many people where you won't have to dilate the cervix for that. So I think in some ways, uh, the, 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 the progress at the moment on endometrial ablation is in trying to get something that's narrower. And, and uh, there are several devices out there. There's the one that the, 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 the <coughs> Indian guys make in San Francisco that's smaller, isn't it? Yeah. But I don't know if that's been widely widely used yet or whatever, but they're, 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 they're coming up. They're, 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 they're coming up. And for the moment, I think we're looking at, 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 uh, at Novasure Thermal Place really as, as, as fulfilling the criteria for, for uh, outpatient acceptability. Um, now, additional procedures. Mary was talking about additional procedures that you're doing here. We're doing with our audit in Monaco, we looked at, at, at polypectomies, uh, SCR sterilizations, biopsies, etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, since that time, there's probably a bigger, a bigger proportion of women coming through for removed coins. I just, just uh, I'd imagine that, 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 that there would be a, that's much more of the workload nowadays, really, I suppose, as times move on. Now, the 5% uh, went on to have a GA interval procedure, whatever it was, be it myomectomy or whatever, you know, and, and, and uh, so most, Three to one, then, the procedures are being carried out, um, see and treat as you go, and, and, and not that many going through to, to, to surgery. So moving on to indication number three and four, um, polyps and fibroids. And generally, with removal of polyps, um, the, the technique has to be needed to use the scissors, a little grasper, and, 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 uh, or maybe a, a bursa point or whatever. And the, the progress in that regard now is, is, has been the introduction of the morselator over the last few years. And, and uh, we're lucky today to have the original inventor of the morselator here today to talk to us. So it's, 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 uh, uh, we're honored, uh, Mark, that you have come to, to, uh, to share uh, your knowledge with us today. So, that, so I won't talk too much about the morselator. Uh, he, he, except to say that, you know, if you want to use the morselator for fibroids, it's a different kettle of fish. And I think that, that uh, it's a very good gadget to suck out a uh, polyp there in about 10 seconds. You know, but, but to work out a fibroid is different. You know, and and, and uh, it's, it's, I've done a few and it's hard work. You know, and, and, and I, I don't know, maybe if, if when you're listening to Mark, just think about the, 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 the difference there. You know, and, and uh, you're trying to pass it off as being just do everything or whatever, but just, you know, Ask him about it, and I think that the, the alternative, really, for for uh, for fibroids, is the old resection. Now, fair enough. Maybe the resectoscope now we can get them smaller. But um, in the meantime, I have a 36-year-old here with one child, heavy menstrual bleeding. Okay. Um, so again, you're looking now at this is this is the, the scope. In the, in the vaginal approach. So that in the vaginal bit, there's often little bits of mucusy bits, and the mucus will bring you to the cervical loss. And then you see the difference. In you go, and, and at this stage, you've got to change the trajectory of the scope and just move it along. Um, and again, the same way where you can see it, and, and, and you'll see the, see the opening at the end. So you can see where you're going, and a little push, boom, at the end, just to get you through into the cavity. So she'll feel this, in you go, and just say, you're going to feel this, bang, and in you go into the cavity. Mm -hmm. So that it's, 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 it's really, I think you're doing most of the talking yourself for the patient and just explaining to them what's, what's, what's happening. But it's good. I think it is good to have a nurse. I'd always have a nurse there as well for that, <laughs> the, that upper end at the same time. Um, now, in this patient, uh, she had a little polyp on one side. And we can just see the little scissors. Now, this, this, she's not going to feel that, that, that uh, uh, scissors cutting. You've got to tell her you're not going to feel this. And, and uh, you just cut it off. With this. So that's... It's, it's quite an easy procedure um, with the little um, uh, with the little scissors and grasper and, and uh, I don't know. I mean, you do it with the scissors, you do it with the first, you do it with the morselator. I mean, you know, morselator is more expensive. You know, I don't know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. No, here we are, morselators. So there's, they, they, there's, so there's there's now there's also a copy device out. The the that. Um, which is, the, which is the, the good one is the true clear, isn't it? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, other, the, the other one is the, 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 the my sure. So yeah, it's, it's, it's single flow against continuous flow. Okay, so the my flow sure is, is single flow. flow. Yeah, okay. So here we are. This is the um, true clear. So you've got different sizes, 5 on 6, 9 on 9. Now, with the 9, you're getting into serious business there for our patients. You know, so, uh, I don't know, 5.6, easy enough. Mm -hmm. But it's it's that's the little working end of it where 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 it works. But this 
obviously it's the subject that we're talking about this afternoon, so I don't want to, 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 to dwell on it too much. And this is the other one. So the similar, the other one is, 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 is quite similar in ways. Uh, but as Mark Hans points out, uh, visualization can be very difficult when there's only a single flow, which is, is, is uh, crucial, I think, to, to, to being able to see what's happening. So now, for those of you who are reading the, the Green Journal, there's a um, paper out in April um, on uh, hysteroscopic morselation uh, compared to the, the resection for polyps. And the senior author is no other than Justin Clark. Um, and congratulations on another, another fine paper from, from uh, Birmingham and Sheffield. And um, again, in comparison to electrosurgical resection during hysteroscopic polypectomy, morselation was significantly quicker, less painful, are more acceptable uh, to women and more likely to completely remove. So in every way, really, I suppose, apart from the cost. So I suppose it's, it's uh, you can measure the cost, you know. Anyway, it's better, a better, a better gadget, a better able to do the, the uh, 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 to take out the, the, and you will mention that a bit just in your talk as well, aren't you, David? Okay, so what's the alternative if you want to take out some thyroid or polyp or something like that in our patients? So several of the companies have produced smaller resectoscopes. Now you look at 21 French Wolf and 22 French Storch. So this is maybe just small enough. This 21 French is the equivalent of seven millimeters. So this kind of one, you can use that as an outpatient gadget, but you're going to have to use local anesthetic and you're going to have to, 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 to. but it's, it's possible to use these. And this particular one is set up so that it'll do monopolar, bipolar. So maybe these kind of gadgets are good. I mean, I've got one of the stores, 22, and I will use it certainly where I need a smaller, uh, a smaller resectoscope than this, because the standard resectoscope is quite a big bit of kit, you know, and, and, and you need serious uh, uh, cervical dilation. So there's no way that you're going to be able to use that for, for, for somebody in our patient unless they have a totally patulous cervix. <coughs> um, but um, what else we're moving on to? Sterilization? Yeah. Um, Sure. for some reason, uh, having been bought by Bayer, is, 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 is now withdrawn from the market in Ireland. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, but luckily, uh, we're developing another one in Ireland. Um, I'll see that an Irish company is, 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 is uh, in the development phase of, of, uh, of uh, a tubal occlusion device. And the, um, this is the little... Um, metal uh, tubal occlusion that we're looking at here. So this is undeployed on the top and uh, it's inserted hysteroscopically through a five French into the tube with the little regular hysteroscope and then the two wings are opened up inside of the tube and, and uh, it gives immediate occlusion and uh, is, is, is uh, um, Walter asked me if I could just share some of this with you so I just said okay. So this is the, 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 the background just to the study. Now the study here is based in, in, in our hospital and we're working also with um, um, some Dutch hospitals. Uh, yeah. So this is, the, this is the little gadget and it's, it's, it's um, so it's, it's, it's just about big enough that it just copes into the, into the, uh, into the tube and we push it in there until, until the wing is <coughs> completely inside. And then just to rotate, we'll deploy, we'll deploy one wing, boom, and there you can just see where the wing is deployed there. And just rotate the other way and it'll, it'll deploy uh, the other wing. And then, ping, there, and just, um, that, that, that cuts off the guide wire and you're left with a little gadget inside. So it's, it's uh, it doesn't leave any trailing bits like the s did or whatever, and, and uh, it's, it's just got, steel in it. There's nothing else in it apart from steel, so it's, it's, it's the same steel as you'll have in uh, cardiac steps, so, it's, 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 so there's a lot of experience with, 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 that, uh, uh, with that metal. Um, and again, this is just the other tube here for, for uh, uh, deployment. And so this has, has and this has gone through several years of, of as you can imagine, of, of, of development on uh, uh, hysterectomy specimens and, and, and it's now reached a stage where, where there are people actually walking around with it in. Um, so the, the, for the, the, the studies now, you can see the little devices there and we put in um, uh, 
uh, uh, died there and, 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 and just mm -hmm. to confirm that there is occlusion at the moment. I mean, for the S year now, they're using ultrasound to, to, to check for tumor occlusion and correct placement of the devices. So uh, this seems to be perfectly okay. But just for, from the study point of view, um, uh, people have the, the, the tubal occlusions uh, confirmed. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, the, when you look at indications for um, hysteroscopy and hysteroscopic operation procedures, uh, you're always going to see the list of uh, infertility, uh, intrauterine adhesions, uh, septum, uh, proximal tubal occlusion. And I think when you look overall at your workloads that's going through your department or whatever, these are very small numbers, and this is, this is fine print stuff. And my personal preference is just to bring these in and do them in theatre under GA. If, you need, if you've got somebody who needs a septum, you just want to get the thing done properly. You know, there aren't that many of them, and I don't think that in the Irish setup there's any great advantage in trying to do these patients uh, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as walk-ins. Um, maybe if you had more of them, whatever, whatever. But, but I, I think there's plenty that we need to do before we start doing difficult adhesions or whatever. I mean, straightforward ones, fine, all right. But if, if, if some of these can be quite tricky cases and, and, and uh, you want to have yourself well set up, I suppose, to, uh, uh, to do them. Now, number 11 is my last, you'll be glad to hear, is the removal of the coil. And I think this is a good one for practice for, for, for uh, uh, something that, that uh, uh, that you want to learn how to use the scope and how to, 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 to manipulate things. So again, this is, this is a, a, a vaginal approach here now just coming through, and you can see the cervix. You'll often see the cervix hanging down. Look at it hanging down there in the front, and you can see the little, um, 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 the, you see the little cervix opening. She's had two cesareans, so you've got a little small, little round cervix, and, and, uh, but it'll still, uh, it'll still go in. This is a five millimeter scope, and, and you know, it goes it in, and it, 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 it'll go in okay. Um, and again, you're looking at the, 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 the posterior wall there of the, the endocervic. Maybe I've knocked it out of seat now, it's just has to mind itself, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, we are, uh, yeah, we leave it well, we better move on, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Glad for the I don't think it's on that island, though, is it? No? There is tours to that island, yeah. The seminar's on that island. The evening bed is. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, with Sandra or something. Okay, I think that we'll probably leave questions for all three speakers until the end.